We have come now to the third and final part of the tenth lesson in an extended series of lessons regarding the church, the second version of these lessons under that title. And we have been studying in this tenth lesson the last two Sundays the work of a local church. And we have noted that each local church must oversee and fund their own work, that it's up to each local church to decide how they are to work according to the apostles' teaching and make their decisions and fund that work, and that the work of individual Christians and a local church are different, uh, and bringing things into the work of a local church that should be left to individuals has caused many local churches to depart from the plain apostles' teaching and do many things like recreation, entertainment, and social meals that should be left to individual Christians to do at their discretion. The work of a local church can be divided into three areas, edification, building up in the faith, uh, including worship, evangelism, teaching the lost the gospel, and benevolence, helping those needy saints among the local church first and then other local churches as we have opportunity. Specifically, what is that work of a local church? There are nine things that we can identify, and we've identified, I believe, three of them. That the local church is to regularly assemble to worship God and work together. And we will specify that as we go through. Uh, we are That assembling is to be done every first day of the week for which we have been missing for almost a year now and for which we pray in spite of all difficulties here in New York City and beyond that his saints may be able to worship and work uh, trusting in God uh, that he will bring it about in spite of all trials that may be faced. But we are to assemble together regularly as his saints. We are to partake in that assembly of the Lord's Supper every Sunday to remember the Lord's death until he comes again and examine ourselves to see whether we are living in the new covenant or not. We are to sing without mechanical instruments, singing and being thankful from the heart. Uh, to God teaching one another in those spiritual songs uh, that we are to sing together. And so we come to the fourth thing, uh, the second thing that we are to do as we, uh, the third thing that we are to do as we uh, assemble together regularly on the first day of the week. We are to pray together, as we have just done online here. We are to pray together. Acts 2 and verse 42, after they became Christians, were baptized upon their believing in Jesus, repenting of their sins, confessing him as the Son of God, and were baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. In Acts 2 and verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That is, they met together and they prayed together. Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And when we give thanks to God, we give thanks also for his mercy, not only for all things, including our trials, but for his gracious mercy, uh, by which we cannot stand. But he graciously forgives us as we repent of our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 9, and confess our sins and pray to him. 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that is beautiful. 
We pray to God daily for mercy. We pray even when we come together that he will be gracious to forgive us as we turn, that we might grow in his grace and knowledge. We pray concerning distressful situations, whether it be this virus or whether it be persecution of Christians or other ailments that may be assailing or whatever it may be, we pray and bring those to God even when we come together, such as the church in Jerusalem, praying for Peter who had been in prison because of his faith in Christ. Acts 12 and verse 5, So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. In verse 7, this prayer was answered miraculously when God released Peter from prison. Acts 12 and verse 7, And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the, in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And so Peter miraculously released the church praying for him. We pray, even though God does not work directly in miracles that we know about today, but his power is still above all, and he can heal and strengthen and overcome trials in whatever way he chooses to do. We pray for all men, especially for their salvation. First, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on, on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, that is, that we may lead the Christian life without being molested or persecuted. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we pray for all men, rulers and so forth, that the gospel may go forward, that the lost may be saved, and Christians may lead the Christian life again without being persecuted or threatened or killed, that God's purpose may go forth. And so we come together to pray, depending upon God, not for ourselves, for our daily physical and spiritual provisions and strength. Then we come together to preach the word of God, to edify the saints and evangelize the lost every Sunday. Preach the word of God uh, together. That is, every Sunday to build each other up in the faith and to teach those who are lost that they may know how to be saved. We are to teach the Word of God as we are doing now, not only in sermons that are brought forth by uh, men, evangelists, preachers, and other men in the congregation, but we can also pre uh, teach in Bible classes where the group of saints are divided so that we can teach children, so that we can teach uh, women and men in separate classes, or we can teach Christians in different maturity levels the Word of God. But we must always remember when we teach the Word of God together that women are not allowed to teach over men or to exercise authority over men, but they may teach women and children. And uh, that is something, even though popular in the world, that women... Uh, our teaching over men publicly, it is something that God has forbidden. Left to our judgment to teach the Word of God on other days besides Sunday, as we do so on Tuesday night, 
When we have our Bible class at 7 p.m. online, we choose to take that as a day. We could take other days uh, and so forth as we have opportunity uh, to do those things. But definitely on the first day of the week, we come together and learn from the Word of God so that we may know how to live as Christians and work as Christians in our individual lives and together as a local church. In Acts 2 and verse 42, again, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, not to the creeds and traditions of men, but to the New Testament, the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, sharing in the work of God together and worshiping, to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, when we were gathered together to break bread, the Lord's Supper, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight, that is, teaching them the Word of God, even until midnight. These things, again, are to be done, teaching the Word of God not to entertain, uh, but to build up in the faith that our minds may not be blinded by Satan, to go off and follow the lies of Satan that are so prevalent in this world today, becoming more and more prevalent as we see what is taking place now. But the Word of God is to edify and strengthen us that we may not be deceived by these lies of Satan and thus fall from our steadfastness. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation let all things be done for edification that is to the building up of one another in the faith and that's why we try to give lessons on a variety of Bible topics both from the Apostles teaching and the Old Testament for our learning and for our encouragement uh, on various topics uh, so that we might be strengthened in as many areas as possible in our faith. And so that the lost may learn the truth about the gospel which Satan has deluded and distorted so that many have become thinking they have been saved by following those things or not following other things when in fact they have never been taught the gospel how to be saved. The plain words of Jesus, Mark 16 and verse 15, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so the idea is go into all the world and we pray that that time will come soon where we can freely go into all the world and preach the gospel. That is a command of God. And countries who violate and try to keep uh, us from preaching the gospel, they will pay the price. It will be a sad price to be paid if, if they are doing it, and some are, if they are doing it because they hate God and hate his gospel, then God is aware of all of these things. And those judgments come and go upon nations who persecute his people. But the command is there, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he who has believed and is baptized, that is, for the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus said, will be saved. And so we teach so that people may know, as we will end the lesson this morning in a few minutes, they will know how to be saved. They will know how 
to become Christians, even though it may, it does conflict with what they have, might have been taught. Women, in spite of so many women preachers and so-called women elders, which there's no such thing as either one, even though they teach over men, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And then he gives his reasons uh, there because man was created first and Eve was deceived uh, first to eat the forbidden fruit. But the point is, people who say that women can teach over men are really overturning what God has said, and that is in their own rebellion. And then we are in Acts 19 and verse 9, as we have opportunity, we can teach the Word of God as much as we are able uh, on the other days besides the first day of the week. Acts 19 and verse 9, in the city of Ephesus, But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the, dis took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so Paul daily taught the Word of God in Ephesus for several years. And we, if we have that opportunity, can do that as well. Not only are we to pray and teach the Word of God along with singing and taking of the Lord's Supper, we are to collect money every Sunday. Funds were to be collected every Sunday when each local church assembled. There's no exact individual percentage that is stated to give, but it is to be a willing sacrifice according to how we have been prospered and our ability to handle our daily obligations to care for our families are balanced. The money is for supporting preachers and elders who work hard in the Word of God and to help needy saints, first among the local church and then other local churches. And also that money that is collected every first day of the week is to be used for expedient expedients that there's judgments of things that are needed to help us carry out the commands of God, such as a meeting place, rented or owned, song books, communion trays for the Lord's Supper, and so on. That we can use that money to do those things because they are things that we can use to carry out the commands of God to worship and to meet together. How do we know that money is to be collected every first day of the week? 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you, al so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. And so we collect money, not only for needy saints, but we saw, and we'll see in just a minute, to support preachers and teachers and to provide, provide for a meeting place. Our giving must be willing and sacrificial. It must be from the heart and our own individual decision, and it must be without regret, joyfully and willingly. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That is, one who gives without regret, regret, willingly, joyously, and sacrificially. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul wrote about the sacrifice of the Macedonian Christians in Philippi, Thessalonica, and other places in relation to giving to the poor saints in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 3, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. It's a beautiful sacrificial giving, even though they were not materially blessed as others, even those in Corinth. They gave sacrificially and joyfully. And that is the way we are to be because the Lord has given all to us that we might be saved, that we might be changed into his image, that we might have hope of eternal life. He gave himself his precious blood on the cross. And so we are to give of our material things to see that his work goes forth and that his saints in need may be helped. Again, that money collected on the first day of the week as we go forward in those nine things, we are to support preachers and elders with that money that is collected each first day of the week. How do we know that? Because we read it in the Word of God. A local church is authorized to support preachers working with them or working with them or in other places. And we can see that in the Word of God we'll read in just a moment. The support for preachers was always sent directly to the preachers and not through a created organization such as a missionary society or an evangelistic society or through another local church that inserts itself into the relationship and they decide for local churches what evangelists will be supported by their collection. That's not what happened. It was sent directly from the local church to the evangelists. A local church can also support elders among them who work hard in teaching the Word of God, that is, those overseers. So how do we know that to be true? Well, in 1 Corinthians 9, and verse 13, really the whole first part of this chapter. But we just read a few verses. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 13, Do you not know, Paul says, that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, referring back to the priest in the Old Testament, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar, that is, God provided that they would have a portion of those things offered for their own daily needs. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. And so there is the authority to support those who are giving their time to preaching the gospel, even among us and even beyond us as we have opportunity that work in other locations. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, 8, 
I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. So Paul took support from the brethren in other churches in the north in Macedonia as he was laboring in Corinth with the church. So that is an example that we can support as we have opportunity. Men who labor in other places in the gospel. And then 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, elders who work hard in teaching the word of God, overseers overseeing the flock in a local church, the church can support them as well in financial through the funds that are collected every Sunday. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages and so we are <clears throat> to help those elders and support them the congregation can do so those who work hard in the word of God not only is that money to be used for the support of preachers and elders, but it is also to be used for the help of the needy saints. Help of the needy saints. Individuals are responsible for helping their own families first. That is, we do all we can with what God provides us to help our families first with those things. But when families cannot fully meet those needs, then the local church must help needy saints among them. And when able, help the needy saints in other local churches. But first among them, the only time that one church ever sent money to another local church was to help needy saints in the receiving churches. Oh, that is such an important point. I have to say that again. In all the apostles' teaching, the only time that one local church sent money to other local churches was to help needy saints in those receiving churches. And if that were done, there wouldn't be churches directing other churches in how they were to spend their money. There wouldn't be churches sending money to rich churches so that they could then order other local churches around. They only sent money to local churches whose saints were in need. The money was never sent to churches not in need. No money was ever sent to local churches that were not in need or to benevolent institutions. That is, again, when a church is not in need or when a organization or church just wants to be in control of local churches to order them around, it was never done in the New Testament, and it should never be done even today. But we are to meet our individual obligations with our families first, and it is a shame if we are not doing that. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 
That is strong language. We are worse than an unbeliever if we do not provide for our own families first. Even those who are widows and are able to work are to provide for those needy in their own families. 1 Timothy 5.16 If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed, that is, those widows who do not have anyone else that are able to meet their needs uh, in that way. So the point is that we are responsible to provide for their own families first, and that tells us that the church is not a welfare society for the world, as, as good as that may sound to people. As compassionate as they may think it is, the church is not a general welfare society to the world. It is a last-minute resource for Christians and their dependents when we are not able to meet our family obligations. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 34, when the saints could not meet their obligations in Jerusalem, what happened? Acts 4 and verse 34, For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need, not want, but need. So a local church is to sacrifice and meet the needs of needy saints in their own midst. When our families cannot do it, then we sacrifice for one another as God has prospered us. And then when able, we are to help needy saints in other local churches such as Paul wrote the Corinthians again and other churches about the saints in Jerusalem and Judea. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, As I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. And so we are to help those in other congregations who are needy. The only time again that local churches sent money to each other was for needy saints in those receiving churches, not to make rich churches richer, but to help those saints that churches could not fully meet those needs. And not a continual contribution, but until the need was supplied, until things they could supply their own needs. Again, Romans 15 and verse 25 Romans 15:25 But now I am going to Jerusalem Paul says serving the saints For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the rich churches in Judea did he say written no for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem And so there it is for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. We sin because saints are in need, not for any other reason to other local churches. Now we come to the last point in our lesson. We are to discipline erring members. This is not a popular subject because many congregations don't discipline any of their members. And sin runs rampant and is openly tolerated and condoned. But yet the word of God is clear. 
after patient, loving, public, and private teaching. That is, from the Word of God. Then Christians who do not repent of publicly known sins are to be lovingly disciplined. How do we discipline? The discipline involves socially withdrawing from rebellious brethren. That is, not eating with them socially and making them think that everything's okay. There is a grieving, there is a mourning over the... Uh, mourning, a grieving over their soul, that they have turned back to sin and will be lost if they do not repent, praying and admonishing them to turn back, but not to continuing to so socialize with them. The goals of this discipline are to keep, that is, socialize, not eating with them, socially or partying with them, acting like everything is wonderful. The goals of this discipline are to keep sin from spreading to, through the local church and bringing the erring brother or sister back to repentance to change their mind and to turn back to God. But the teaching must be done publicly and privately when necessary so that we can correct one another. Acts 20 and verse 20, Paul said to the elders at Ephesus, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God changing our minds about our sins toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he taught not only publicly but from house to house when necessary. And that is to encourage those that we might repent and trust and obey the Lord Jesus by the apostles' teaching. But he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, a startling situation with one of the brothers there. Corinth was a wicked, idolatrous city, much like New York City, a seaport, wicked, idolatrous city in general. And it had all the vices and sins and they were popular and at times overwhelming in the culture. Fornication was one of them. Even using fornication as an act of worship and idolatry had been common for hundreds and thousands of years. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality, that is fornication, uh, that is sexual sin outside of marriage, scriptural marriage. There is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. What type of fornication is that? Well, he says that someone has his father's wife. Someone is committing sexual sin with his father's wife. That is this brother in Corinth, a child of God. Then he says about the Corinthian church, You have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, you're not grieving over this brother's sins. You're glad he is in your midst, even though you know he has committed shameful things that even... The Gentile culture around you, as wicked as it is, would, would have trouble accepting that he has his father's wife. So that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. That is, that you would socially withdraw from him, stop eating with him, mourn over his condition openly. For I on my part, Paul said, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, 
when you are assembled and I with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough that sin spreads throughout a congregation if it is condoned? What did he mean by turning the brother over to Satan? Well, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5 explains it. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5, But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, a fornicator like this brother was, an open fornicator who co or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, a con man, con woman, not even to eat with such a one. So that is what he's talking about, that you socially withdraw from these individuals, that you mourn over their spiritual condition, pray for them, lovingly rebuke them, that they might be brought back to repentance, and that you stop condoning their sins, that you're going to be lost with them if you don't exercise this loving discipline toward them. And yet, in many congregations, including local churches of Christ, people will say, oh, we cannot stop eating with people in our individual social gatherings. We cannot stop eating with them. That will insult them. That will upset them. That will drive them away from the congregation. Did we just read the words of the Apostle Paul and what he said commanded was the loving thing to do when you have a brother or sister after much teaching publicly and privately who continue in open sin his words are so clear stop eating with them admonish them lovingly pray for them that they might be brought back to repentance, brought back to the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14, he admonished that they don't continue to condone those who are lazy and do not work, that they stop providing food for those individuals. If anyone does not work, don't let him eat. But then he says in verse 14 of 2 Thessalon Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. We don't like that word shame, but that's what he said, shame over their sin. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Does God's loving discipline work? It may not work because of the stubbornness of the person, but it may work in some cases. And whether it works or not, it's the way that God says that we must behave as a local church if we're going to please him when the occasion calls for it. Did it work in the case of the brother who had his father's wife? Yes. He grieved over his sins. His sorrow led him to repent, change his mind, and turn back to God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul wrote and he said, Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. 
All right, now he has been brought back to repentance. Stop your disciplining and withdrawing from him socially and accept him lovingly back as a brother through God's mercy which has been supplied to him and to you. That has been help brought about by following God's way of lovingly disciplining a brother or sister in Christ. What have we learned now? That each local church must oversee and fund their own work. That the work of individual Christians and a local church are different. The work of a local church can be divided into edification, spiritual building up, Benevolence, helping needy saints, and evangelism, spreading the gospel to the lost. That work of the local church can be identified in nine areas that we see. Regularly assembling together to worship and work together, we are to provide a place to regularly assemble, especially on the first day of every week. Second, partake of the Lord's Supper when we come together. Third, we are to sing without mechanical instruments of music, spiritual songs to teach one another and praise God. Fourth, we are to pray together. Fifth, we are to preach and teach the Word of God to edify one another and teach the lost how to be saved. Sixth, we are to collect money every first day of the week, and that money is to be used, seventh, to support preachers and elders who teach the Word of God among us and in other places as we have opportunity to preach as to help evangelists in other areas. Eighth, we are to use the money to help the needy saints, first among the local church among us and then in other local churches as we have the opportunity. And then ninth, we are to lovingly discipline erring members who refuse to repent of their open sins that they may be brought back to the Word of God before it's ever too late. And so those are those nine things so simply brought forth in the Word of God that bring glory to God as we work together as he is commanded as a local church. And if you are in a local church that is doing differently, that is adding those things or taking them away to the work of a local church, then please consider leaving that local church if they cannot be turned to the word of God and finding or starting a local church that would be true to the apostles' teaching. And if you're not already a Christian, maybe you believe that a Christian is one who has said the sinner's prayer and has asked God to forgive, but that is not in the Word of God in the apostles' teaching. No matter how popular it is taught, neither is infant baptism. Neither is a direct experience of the Holy Spirit. None of that is how we are saved. But when we look into the Word of God, when the gospel was first preached in Acts chapter 2, when they heard that Jesus had died for their sins, was raised from the dead, and seated at the right hand of God where he is now as head of his one church, ruler of the nations, high priest before God. They cried out, What shall we do? In verse 37, and Peter said in verse 38, Repent. Now that you believe in Jesus, repent. Change your mind about your sins, and each of you be baptized, immersed in water, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's what thousands did on that day. And in Acts chapter 8, the latter part of the chapter, when the Ethiopian eunuch believed in Jesus, was willing to repent of his sin, he confessed Jesus to be the Son of God, and he was baptized. 
by the road where they found some water enough to immerse him, fully submerge him in the water for the forgiveness of his sins. So that is how people became Christians, willing to repent of their sins, believing in Jesus, confess him as the Son of God, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That is how to become a child of God. And then meeting together to be devoted to the apostles' teaching so that we may learn to work together practicing those things that we have just studied as a local church. And those who are Christians, let us be willing to turn away from our sins, to repent and to pray that the Lord may once again forgive us by His grace as fallen Christians that we might be brought back to Him and be able to grow and encourage one another and be a light to a lost and dying world through the light of the gospel. If anyone is here and subject to that gracious, wonderful, powerful invitation, that gospel invitation, we would encourage anyone and everyone to respond at the earliest as we draw our lesson for now to a close.